There's a new camera in town and it's one of the most affordable, cooled, dedicated astronomy cameras ever made. The ZWO ASI 585MC Pro may have a tiny sensor, but that doesn't mean it can't do what the big boys can. If you're currently shooting with a DSLR camera, a dedicated astronomy camera may be on your wish list. In this video, I'll talk about why you should take a good look at the 585MC Pro and cover the benefits and quirks of using a one-shot color astronomy camera like this for astrophotography. I had a chance to meet up with the ZWO team in New York last month, and I told them I was interested in demoing the new 585 MC Pro on the channel. Why? Because any time a product fills a gap in the beginner stages of the astrophotography journey, I'm intrigued. The ASI 533 MC Pro used to hold down the best starter astro cam category, in my mind at least. So it'll be interesting to see if the smaller 585 can live up to that title. It has a CMOS sensor that was designed for long exposure deep sky astrophotography through a telescope. While your DSLR has a bigger sensor and is easier to control and use with lenses, this little guy was built for taking five minute long exposures for using duo narrowband filters, for live stacking the ring nebula on your tablet. Yes, there's a bit of a learning curve to switch to a dedicated astronomy camera, but when you get to the other side, you'll wonder how you ever lived without a highly sensitive minus 10 degrees Celsius CMOS sensor. So why is the 585 MC Pro the cheapest option in this category? There's always a catch. Well, it's the size of the sensor and maybe the 12-bit ADC. Let me explain. There are pros and cons to a sensor this small. It's great for photographing planets because for that type of astrophotography, you need a high frame rate. And this bad boy can do almost 50 frames per second at its native resolution. A camera that is equally as capable of planetary imaging as well as deep sky is actually quite rare. For deep sky imaging, you may find the field of view to be a little limited. Just look at how much smaller your image frame is through a 300 millimeter telescope compared to a DSLR. It's something you'll need to work with and plan for. The other key spec of this camera is the pixel size at 2.9 microns. It's best used with a telescope in the 250 to 600 millimeter range. The 12 bit thing seems to be the perfect argument starter on cloudy nights. Compared to the more expensive 14 bit ASI 533MC Pro, it's possible that you could achieve a higher dynamic range using this camera's older brother. All I can say from my experience is that these specs don't make as much of a difference in your final image as you may think, but it's something to keep in mind. There are two things about the ASI 585 MC Pro that stand out to me. One is that I think this camera would make the perfect live stacking camera for outreach or just fun in the backyard. I've been using the 533 MC Pro for this purpose, but I think this one will do even better because I can throw on a Barlow lens and hop over to a planet and benefit from that high frame rate. The other is the 4K image resolution. This is the perfect image format for a YouTube image reveal. I know that's something most people won't think of, but the square sensor on the ASI 533 made it a bit awkward to display my final reveal image in a YouTube video. So this is the main imaging system I'm going to use for my deep sky project tonight. This telescope has a focal length of 640 millimeters with that 0.8 times reducer in place with an F ratio of 5.6. While I could get a slightly sharper image using something with a little less focal length like the RedCat 61 at 300 millimeters, I wanted just a little more aperture to pull in some photons. I think the Starfield Gear 115 is a real sleeper scope. I love that I can set it up quickly on the portable AM5. My image scale with this combination is right around one arc second per pixel. The ASI Air makes it easy to test out some of the live stacking features of this camera, and then it can run my entire imaging session, including controlling the mount later on for my deep sky project. Look, I know I use the ASI Air a lot on this channel, but as someone that's not only doing astrophotography, but also filming it, this thing makes my life a lot easier. There are a lot of other great options for running a night of astrophotography, but this one is just too painless and easy for me to not take advantage of. I have a pretty interesting target lined up for tonight, one that I've never shot before. 
It's an emission nebula in the constellation Cygnus known as Sharpless 112. I found this by using the HIPS survey overlay in Stellarium, which is super helpful for planning nebula projects. Sharpless 112 is a perfect fit in terms of my field of view, and it should look great with the duo narrowband filter I have in front of the camera, the Optolong L Extreme. As usual, a pesky full moon will be hanging out with me all night, so shooting a broadband target was out of the question. You may have noticed this giant Newtonian reflector telescope in the background. This one is still set up from the last time I used it about two weeks ago, and I just had the 365 cover on it ever since. So tonight I'll just be doing some live stacking with this one just for fun while I have the primary setup doing my deep sky project. So the way I have it set up here, I just have a filter drawer in front of the camera. I have the uh, 55 millimeter back spacing, and then I use the filter drawer to put in the Optolong L Extreme filter. It's a pretty convenient way to put it into the imaging train. It is that time of year, and Ash and I are slowly getting really into gardening. We're starting to get our annuals, and we've got a bunch of perennials already, but it's just a great time of year for this kind of stuff. You can see the telescope pointed at Vega, one of the brightest stars in the night sky. You might see an airplane flying through there as well. Um, so this is my field of view with this camera sensor. So I'm in pretty tight on, you know, pretty well everything. The target I'm going after is in Cygnus. Sharpless 112 is, there it is, right there. Look at that. So it's a kind of a different looking object. And as you can see, I'm gonna frame it up pretty well perfectly with this field of view. So I'm waiting for it to get a little bit higher in the sky. I can put my duo narrowband filter in there and really focus it up. I can use Deneb right close by to get real precise focusing there. So I'm just waiting for this object to get a little bit higher in the sky and then I'll start running my sub exposures on it. Okay, right now we're looking at my unprocessed stack on Sharpless 112 using the 585 MC Pro. So this is about 60 frames, three minute subs each. And as you can see, just with an auto stretch on here, the data looks pretty good. It's not overly noisy. Uh, there's some pretty substantial gradients going on, but I think that's mostly due to the extreme conditions of the night that I photographed it. There was a full moon and I was shooting right into the city to start out. It gradually got darker as it got into the better part of the sky. But to look at these exposures in detail, I like to use a tool called Blink in PixInsight. And here you can actually play uh, kind of a video of each sub exposure. And it's the best way to really review FITS files that were captured with a dedicated astronomy camera. So you can really see a lot that's going on there. So you could see some high clouds that pass through that I didn't realize happened because I was sleeping. And then I shoot right into the daylight. That's why it gets white there. But these are really raw image exposures. And you can see some stuff like, I see kind of a dark color bar on the right there. So I don't know if this is a calibration issue or something that will be hard to calibrate out, I should say. But it just, it tells you the real story of the raw data in your images, so really handy to use Blink. Now looking at my stacked final here with an auto stretch on it, you know, real quickly, we could we can get rid of that um, darkness at the bottom there using the automatic background extractor. I'll just run that and this should clean that up, but I know because I've, I've already done this, it's gonna reveal some other issues too. So um, it's, it's possible that it's bad calibration frames or some light leak or something, um, but you know, this is pretty typical for a lot of the images I take to look pretty, uh, you know, unsightly, at least at this stage until I clean them up a little bit. So again, early test results on this camera. I wanted to show you the behind the scenes image data. Uh, everything looks good so far. 
Uh, we'll see what kind of image I can produce out of this when I process it further, but I wanted to share this stage with you. Before I get to the reveal, just a few quick notes about the camera. I ran it again last night, this time using the huge Quattro 300P reflector. I chose to capture the Crescent Nebula in Cygnus, and each subframe looked incredible as it came through. However, throughout the session, I saw a few weird subframes, and I am not sure what the cause is. If you look at the blink subs, you can see a brightening event with some odd artifacts. I can confirm that these are not clouds, so I don't know if it's just the sensor adjusting to the ambient temperature or what. I'm sure there's an explanation, I just don't know what it is. I managed to get a great image of the Crescent Nebula with this camera, but I thought it was worth mentioning that anomaly. If you have a 585 MC Pro, let me know if you've seen anything like this. Okay, back to the reveal. 